Today's podcast of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. I'm happy to hear that many of you enjoyed the Wretched Roundtable episode I did recently with some listeners. So I want to invite more of you into the conversation. If you want to be part of an upcoming roundtable show, send me an email to scott at hellbentforhar.com or private message me on Twitter at hellbenthar. Tell me what you like about horror. Tell me what your favorite horror film is and why it's your favorite. Give me some details about yourself as a horror fan or tell me your philosophy, whatever interests you enough to talk about. I look forward to all those conversations. I also want to thank everyone that listens to the podcast for keeping this conversation going. This show is a grassroots movement, and you've been growing it. Hellbent for Horror has been downloaded in all 50 states here in the U.S. You guys are listening in L.A. and New York and Chicago and in Jacksonville, Florida and Winston-Salem, North Carolina and Chattanooga, Tennessee. And a hello to my listener in Roswell, New Mexico. But this grass isn't just growing in my backyard. Hellbent for Horror is growing globally, and it's a joy to hear from listeners from other countries. You're not only listening in the United Kingdom and Ireland, but also France and Japan and Australia and China and the Philippines and Bulgaria, just to name a few. Brian from Bulgaria messaged me to say how much he enjoys the show, and I really appreciate any time someone takes the time to express themselves that way. Brian, I'm glad you like what you hear. I'm overjoyed that there are pockets of listeners all over the world, because it proves something that I love about horror. Horror is universal. We are all scared of the same things, no matter what continent or culture we come from. A great horror story reminds us of all the similarities we have. And when we see how we are all vulnerable to the same feelings, it humanizes us, which is what any art form should do. Now, I wanted to say thank you to my international audience. Please excuse me for murdering your language. For my French listeners, merci. For my Japanese listeners, domo. For those of you in Iceland, thaka thiar. And those in Belgium, blog daria. In China, si sia. For my listeners in Brazil, I say obrigado. And danke to the Netherlands, gracias to Spain. And my listeners in Germany, danke. And for those in the Philippines, salamat. And tak to my listeners in Sweden and Denmark, but it's tak skal duha in Norway. For my listeners in Indonesia, I say Teri Makasi, and I apologize if that's pronounced horribly. For the Russian Federation, I say Spasiba, and Achu for Lithuania. For the listener in Israel, I say Toda. Grazie for those in Italy, and I know that sounded terrible. And Terima Kasi for the listeners in Singapore, and a warm Dahanyavad to my listeners in India. Whew! And conjuring up that international feel of the show today reminds me of how important foreign films had been in expanding my appreciation of cinema. In fact, foreign films got me through the years when the American horror scene was going through a rough patch. That rough patch was the 1990s, pretty much the whole decade. And in that period, when the internet was still in its very early stages and drive-in theaters were dying out and thrillers replaced horror movies and cinemas, there was one oasis in the desert, the video store. I know, I know, ancient history, right? Next, I'll start talking about the Model T Ford or the invention of bread. But I'm not a Luddite who cries for the old days and says everything new is substandard. First off, I'm podcasting to the entire planet, so I'd sound like an idiot if I did that. This is a great time to be a horror movie fan. There is so much information that can be found easily. In many ways, your film education today is only limited by your own curiosity. 
but I still believe a celebration of the video store is in order. Home video was a cultural movement. It was a moment where the audience had unprecedented freedom of choice. It allowed artists like Buster Keaton and Orson Welles and, yes, Herschel Gordon Lewis get rediscovered as innovators. And it gave low-budget filmmakers a chance for equal representation with the big-budget studio films for once. And it gave the movie lover a chance to own more than just the memory of the movies they loved. Movies were finally given the courtesy that all other art forms already had, the ability for the average Joe to collect them, like albums and books and reprints of paintings had been. You didn't have to be rich, you didn't have to be lucky to study movies. Personally, the video store became my university, my graduate school for cinema, and it only cost me $1.99 per class. Unless I forgot to rewind, then it cost more. Now, as I've said before, most cool cultural movements aren't planned. They happen by accident, usually to fill a void and to make a buck. And then it becomes something special on its own. In the 1920s, newspapers reprinted old comic strips in a magazine format to make a quick buck. Boom, the comic book is born. In the 1950s, movie studios syndicate their old horror movies to television to make a buck. Boom, the creature feature show and the horror host are born. In the early 1970s, when New York City is bankrupt, struggling businesses let amateur musicians play in their bars, or they let artists show amateur movies on the walls just to make a buck. And boom, punk rock and the no-wave underground movement were born. And it's the same story for the home video market and the birth of the video store. In the early 1970s, cable television proved that customers would pay to watch movies, commercial-free and unedited, from their homes. Cable success cut into both television and the movie studio's profits. So those two groups rummaged through their old stuff to see what they could make a buck on. They combined the studio's movie libraries with an old broadcasting technology called videotape, and the consumer video cassette was born. You could buy a movie, and you could watch it whenever you wanted, and you could pause it if the phone rang. It sounds like a no-brainer that this would take off, right? Not so fast. Just like every other cultural movement, the money guys had no idea what they had. Take videotape itself. Networks had been recording certain shows on tape since the 1950s, but they thought so little of it that they reused the tapes and recorded over them to save money. How little did they think of recording events on videotape? Network television footage of Super Bowl II no longer exists. That's right, they recorded over Super Bowl II. And they had no idea who their customers were. In the beginning, home video was considered a luxury item, and you had to buy everything. And the VCRs and the movies were very expensive. Early VCRs cost $1,000 in the 1970s. I think it's like $8,000 in 2016 dollars. There was no thought given to rental. And that was the best thing that could have happened for all of us. Because if the money men knew what they had from the beginning, we'd have just gone right to the blockbuster video chain phase. Only certain movies would have ever been available and studio films would get top billing and every store would have been the same bland carbon copies across the country. Instead, the barnstormers got into the act first. And that's the reason I feel this phenomenon is really worthy of discussion. It's easy to look back at the video store as just a movie version of a fast food chain. But because video stores started with a few independent owners who bought movies and then rented them out, we get a grassroots phenomenon. Like bookstores or record stores, the early video stores didn't have a corporate vibe. So these little stores that popped up had their own unique personalities and idiosyncrasies. And to be successful, the stores reflected the tastes and interests of their communities. So a video store in Nebraska might stock different movies than one in Manhattan would. These stores weren't run by marketing executives. These were just small businessmen, neighbors really, and they conducted their business analysis in the time-honored tradition of throwing it against the wall to see what sticks. Of course, every store bought any of the movies that the studios released, but as demand grew, many stores needed to get more supply. And that's when small independent video companies started to show up. Vestron Video, Lightning Video, Vidmark Entertainment, Magnum Entertainment, New World Video, Troma Entertainment, Wizard Video, Gorgon Video. And that's when things got interesting. 
These small labels specialize in B-movies, exploitation films, action films, obscure foreign cult films, midnight movies, and most importantly, horror movies. Lots of horror movies. They were cheap to buy, and they made their money back fast for the owners. And the garish and outrageous box art for these independents were just amazing. Kroger Bab and the other exploitation kings of the 40s would have approved. I particularly love the box art for Screamers, the 1981 movie, not the 1995 one with Peter Weller. The box art on Screamers had a man who was turned inside out on the cover. The tagline, They're men turned inside out, and worse, they're alive. There was even a warning label. Be warned, you will actually see a man turned inside out. Spoiler alert, you don't! The movie was originally titled The Island of the Fishmen, so it did include fishmen, but not any inside-out men. The inside-out man scene was filmed for the movie trailer when they renamed the movie Screamers and put it back out for sale. But it's not in the movie. And yet, Screamers made its money back. So horror sections started to appear in video stores, and they'd rent anything. To the average store owner, a horror movie was a horror movie was a horror movie, right? And let's face it, nobody said you had to be a cineast to run a video store. All kinds of community standards were broken, and nobody knew until a parent complained, like Faces of Death. And this was just a dream come true for a guy like me. I loved all types of movies, but I was restricted to what was in the theaters or any movies I could catch on cable or regular TV. Older movies, for the most part, were lost to me. And I was a reference book kid, so I read film books and critical reviews on anything from Hammer films to Grindhouse to cult films and even the notorious ones that were banned. So I knew there was a whole universe of movies that I was born too late to see, and I only knew about them by reputation. I could only envision the scenes I read about in my head until the video store opened in town. So I was finally able to see Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace, and I got to see Tombs of the Blind Dead, and even big movies like Rosemary's Baby that came out before I was old enough to see it. And I got to see Bloodsucking Freaks, which made an impression. And I finally got to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which let me know that people who write movie books can also be full of shit. That was when I realized that some experts didn't even watch the movies they criticized. I guess they didn't see the video rental market coming either. Now I want to take a moment to put things into perspective. Because I know that talking about the 1990s as a horror movie drought makes some eyes roll. There certainly were good horror movies released in theaters during that decade like Candyman and In the Mouth of Madness and the original Scream. But the 1980s, especially the early 1980s, were an embarrassment of riches. We were amid the modern horror renaissance that, from 1974 until around 1984, saw a huge number of iconic and game-changing horror films released in movie theaters. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Jaws, The Exorcist, The Omen, Dawn of the Dead, Suspiria, Halloween, Phantasm, Alien, The Thing, An American Werewolf in London, Friday the 13th, Poltergeist, The Shining, and Nightmare on Elm Street, just to name the bigger titles were all new, never before seen, all in one decade. And there was a time around 1982 where a new horror film opened every week. Add to that the older horror films and direct-to-video movies at the video store suddenly amazingly available to us, and it was sensory overload of the best kind. The 1980s were known for excess. Of course, what comes up must come down. I see similarities between the decline of the popularity of horror movies in the 1990s to the decline of heavy metal during the same time. Quantity is not quality. And by the end of the 1980s, a lot of the American horror movies and the metal bands were more about marketing than heart. Metal was replaced by grunge, which flirted with the loud guitar sound but never fully cranked it out. Horror was replaced by thrillers, which flirted with all the horror tropes, but always seem to hold back. If you search on Wikipedia for a list of horror films by decade, you can see the number of horror films made every year shrink as the 1990s rolled on. And the supply of horror movies in the video stores was getting stale too. 
Video rental went from being a moneymaker for mom and pop stores to a cottage industry for the studios and the distributors. The focus shifted to pushing video stores to buy large numbers of new releases, which were movies that played in theaters just three months earlier. Video stores buying huge numbers of tapes gave these movies a second helping a box office, but this meant that there was less budget for the small video stores to experiment. And that meant that many stores carried the same movies. I remember going to different stores just to see if I could find one new box cover I didn't know by heart and coming out disappointed. The money men finally figured out what they had and right on cue, only certain movies were available, studio movies were pushed, and video stores across the country were bland carbon copies of each other. But not all of them. Sometimes you get lucky and you stumble upon a gem where you'd least expect it. I didn't expect to find a gem of a store hidden in the middle of nowhere in Connecticut. Hell, I didn't expect to find myself stuck in the middle of nowhere in Connecticut. And I certainly didn't expect to find salvation in the middle of nowhere in Connecticut. Let me explain. Just like horror movies and heavy metal, I was in a decline at the start of the 1990s. When I graduated high school in the mid-80s, I was full of ambition, but I had no direction. I wanted to go to college for film studies and then film school, but my family didn't like the idea and, quite honestly, there wasn't any money. My future was working in a textile plant unless I took control, so I joined the Air Force to get out of town and hopefully get some cash to go to school afterwards. However, somewhere in those four years of active service, I lost sight of that. The Air Force was an amazing experience, but military service is a world all its own with its own logic and its own sense of purpose. It's a way of life, 24-7, and while you're in it, you are fully immersed. And I think that's why some of us have a hard time acclimating back to civilian life when we finally get out. When you're in the service, you don't realize that you're isolated on that base, and the world outside is a lot different than what you've gotten used to. And when you get out, and the rules have changed, you just feel out of step. At least, that's how I felt, and what happened to me. I went back to my hometown, and it seemed like everything changed. Friends got married and had kids or moved away, and I felt like I just slept through it all. I was really restless and really irritable. I just didn't have the stomach for bullshit, which was what the world seemed to be running on. I had a mouth, and I had a temper, and I had no filter, so I alienated some people. And some of those people included co-workers, and bosses, and old friends. So I started moving around some, taking jobs here and there, moving from state to state, meeting people, doing the same thing, but they were going in the opposite direction, and that was fine by me. This world needed less chatter, in my opinion. I look back on it now, and I realize that I was headed towards the edge of the grid, a blip, ready to pass off the radar. In early 1990, a series of bizarre events led me to live in Storrs, Connecticut. Let's just say my plans, for what they were worth, fell through in another state, and it was healthier for me to move on. It was pure luck that I ended up there. Now, Storrs was a college town, but it was a small college, especially in 1990. It was about 30 miles outside of Hartford, and there was nothing but farmland in between. Colleges in the middle of nowhere are usually small cities under themselves, full of energy and nightlife, but Storrs was a sleepy town where the traffic lights flashed yellow at night. So I didn't have high hopes when I pulled into the strip mall at the edge of town to check out the only video store I could find. It was called Video Visions. Now, by this time, most video stores were just letdowns for me. Blockbuster Video had changed the game. Their stores were bright and cheery and full of noise from televisions. The stores were huge, but I doubt they displayed many more movies than smaller stores did. It was all in how they made it look. They had an army of cashiers armed with smiles and lasers, so you didn't have to wait long. I could get in and out of a blockbuster and not have to say more than six words to anyone. 
and Blockbuster's success affected the smaller stores I went to. They got quieter and they got smaller. There was very little chatter and sometimes the owner wouldn't even look up from his book. The videos would be marked to rent or to buy. The small business owners were ready to pack it in. I could get in and out of a mom and pop store and not have to say more than six words to anyone, which was just how I liked it. See, I was in a splendid isolation where I wanted everything to just be a transaction and nothing more. Get in, get out, go home. Or so I thought. So I went into Video Visions. It was a big store for a mom and pop establishment, probably two units in the strip mall. The owner smiled behind the counter at me and I made my rounds through the stacks. Now, I had developed movie eye by then, which is kind of like what hardcore album collectors have in record stores. You know, they flip through a stack of albums in seconds and rarely stop to look at one. They flip through so many albums that they look for patterns and shapes and colors. They stop when they see a pattern they don't know. I was the same way in video stores. So I was at the back wall of the store when a box with interesting blue lettering made me stop. It was Dennis Hopper's infamous The Last Movie, the movie he made right after Easy Rider. That destroyed his career. That only played in one theater for two weeks and disappeared. He didn't make another movie until 1980, and that was the insane and rare Out of the Blue, which was sitting on the shelf right next to The Last Movie. Oh, shit. I had stumbled into the great director's section there, and I'd stagger out a few hours later. Francis Ford Coppola was there, but so was his movie Dementia 13, his horror movie, which he kind of disowned. But next to Coppola was John Carpenter with a copy of Dark Star, which he also disowned. And next to that was a Wes Craven section with a copy of Deadly Blessing. And next to that was a Bob Clark section. Yes! a Bob Clark section, with a copy of Death Dream. I looked up, but this wasn't a horror shelf within the director's section. No, there was no separation. Sure enough, there's Dario Argento's section with a copy of Dario Argento's World of Horror right next to Michelangelo Antonioni. And Romero's section had Season of the Witch and The Crazies and Document of the Dead. And they had a copy of John Borman's Point Blank, Now, I know that these movies are readily available now, and that just proves what a great time it is to be a movie lover. But back then, some of these movies were rare finds. Some had a limited video release that didn't sell well, and they went right back into the vault to gather dust. And I'm sure that prestigious video stores in major cities probably had them as well. But in a small town whose local government was still on the Grange system? This was a surprise. And there was another surprise. I was really excited, not just to see these movies, but to talk about them with someone. I was compelled. So this is where I get to sound like an even bigger weirdo than I normally do. Somewhere in my time in the Air Force, I lost my passion. I wasn't even sure I knew what my passion was, which was really frustrating but I could just feel something kind of drift away. Of course, I was kept busy in the military being a crash firefighter and life was full of adrenaline and action, so I didn't really notice. It was when I got out and things slowed down that I felt an emptiness. What was I supposed to be? What was my use? I knew what my use was when I was an airman and a firefighter. Now I'm neither of those things. What's my use? I had no clue. I felt useless. And so I rambled around trying to figure that one out. But I found myself surrounded by people who I had nothing in common with. So little by little, I communicated with other people less and less. Now, I know you're probably thinking that horror movies were my lost passion, but I never stopped watching horror movies through all of my wandering time. I mentioned how video stores were my university, my grad studies in the 1990s. 
you go to universities to learn something you don't know. So watching movies was the homework. What I learned was that watching movies wasn't enough. I had to share them with people. I needed to share my love for them and have people share theirs with me. It's funny how in the end, it all comes down to connecting with other people. It comes down to belonging. I went to the front counter and I started a membership and I couldn't help but gush over some of the titles I found to Mike and Kim Kavarovics. They were the mom and pop of the store. It was obvious they were movie lovers, and they collected these films over the years, some which held sentimental value to them. Sometimes there was trivia written on the box art, and sometimes there was a personal recollection. Mike was pleased I knew some of the obscure stuff, and as I left, he said the magic words. Let me know what you think of it. I'd stop in several times a week and get more movies, and we'd have more conversations. And often, those conversations would overflow to include other customers who had questions or comments. I loved to talk about movies that they were excited by, and then I'd recommend ones they may have never seen. And of course, I loved slowly winning them over on a horror movie, even if we started on a mainstream film. Sometimes, people would stand around for a half hour after renting a movie just to talk. Because when you get people to talk about something they love... They can talk all night. It didn't take long for me to be the go-to guy on horror movie picks whenever I was in the store. By the way, they had a great horror section, which you would expect, and it also bled into a great cult section. And after a while, they offered me a job. It's an interesting thing. Bars don't hire alcoholics to be bartenders. Casinos don't hire compulsive gamblers to be croupiers. But video stores hire movie junkies without batting an eye. And it was a fun job. I got to talk to so many people. And I worked with so many great folks. We turned each other on to a lot of cool movies and directors. And thanks to Video Visions being a place that still took chances, I weathered the 1990s drought. The answer was foreign horror films. I got introduced to Guillermo del Toro with Kronos and Peter Jackson with both Bad Taste and Dead Alive and Laws von Trier with The Kingdom. And movies like Tetsuo, The Iron Man and its sequel Body Hammer got me to find movies like The Untold Story and Man Bites Dog and Jan Svankmeyer's Alice. It also got me to go back and watch movies like Onababa and How Su, which weren't available to me before. I got introduced to the world of Coffin Joe with At Midnight, I'll Take Your Soul. If I only accomplish one thing with this episode, let it be that someone listening watches a Coffin Joe movie. And I loved getting people excited about forgotten movies. I'd put on Peter Medak's The Changeling from 1980, and I don't think I ever had to put it away. Somebody always rented it. I had found a community And I had found friends. And I had found a usefulness at just the right time. And I'm grateful. And Kim and Mike did something right because they lasted 26 years. Video Visions closed in 2009. You know, a great movie selection matters. But what really made Video Visions so good was that it fit the community like a glove. And in turn... The community supported it completely. Kim and Mike and their staff loved to talk, and they knew their movies. But there was none of that elitism that comes into play a lot of times in some places. Case in point, Mike loved race cars and muscle cars, so they carried every great car movie, from Tulane Blacktop and Vanishing Point to Eat My Dust and Funny Car Summer, and even Fast Company, directed by a young David Cronenberg. That would be found in the great director's wall, by the way. There wasn't a pretentious bone in their bodies. Hey, it might be a college town, but it is still in the middle of nowhere. You better have a sense of humor. And the legacy of the home video revolution and the video store continues. The idea of watching unedited movies at home morphed into streaming video services. And there's a ton of movies that were at one time considered lost that you can find on YouTube. You can thank an old cranky videotape hoarder for those. Right before YouTube bans them, that is. 
and the home video revolution gave birth to a generation of filmmakers and writers who honed their skills as clerks and passed on their knowledge. Because passing on the knowledge is where the real joy is. The joy is connecting with others. The joy is knowing you're not alone. The joy is belonging. The one thing I do mourn is the loss of the physical store, not just because holding a physical movie in your hand made it feel all that more important. The key thing was the gathering, the meeting of people with like minds, the talking, the enjoying of each other. Watching the movies is great, but sharing them, that's how stories come alive. And if there's one thing that I do wish for you is that you find your way to talk about your love of horror movies, blog, podcast, start a meetup, start a YouTube page. And by the way, independent video stores aren't dead. There are over 150 of them still running in North America alone. If you do go to one, send me a picture of you there. Holding the box for screamers. And thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. And I've also updated my Hellbent for Horror website, hellbentforhorror.com. You can download every episode directly from there, read any newsletters, and you can go to any of my social websites and emails all from the homepage. You can IM me on my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. And you can find me on Twitter at hellbenthorror. A lot of the great conversations I have with fans happens on Twitter at hellbenthorror. Now, for you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me. I thank you in advance. And thank you for listening, folks. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Player FM, and Stitcher. And if you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. It really helps. Till next time, stay hell-bent.